Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to our picture language seminar. Uh, we are really happy today to have Daniel Gottesman. And as you can see on the screen, we also have a very good lineup for the next four talks. Roberto Longo, Werner Nam, Alina Vadiva, and Scott Aronson. And if you miss the talks here, you can find from our seminar page on the Picture Language website, a link to videos. And later today or tomorrow, we'll have Daniel's talk there too. So Daniel really needs no introduction, but I'll give a brief one anyway. He was a Harvard undergraduate class of 1992, majored in physics, got his PhD with John Preskill at Caltech, he was one of the first four persons whom I hired at the Clay Institute as long-term fellow when he was still in his 20s. That was in 1998. I remember Peter Schor recommending him to me in a conversation we had in Berlin at the International Congress of Mathematicians. Now Daniel is <clears throat> professor at the Perimeter Institute. His famous work that he started in 1998 on quantum error correction uh, is known as the Gottesman Mill theorem. And I realized from looking at his CV that Daniel even has a patent for quantum error correcting codes and devices. So Daniel, it's a real pleasure to have you here and we're all looking forward to your talk. Hey, thanks. That patent is actually expired by now. Oh wait, uh, who's disabled attendee screen sharing? I think you need to let me share a screen. Okay. You can do it now. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so what I thought I would talk about today is uh, the idea of using picture languages, I guess, to, to prove things about uh, fault tolerant quantum computation. So this is actually pretty old work. If you, if you look, you can see the archive number down here is using the old uh, system, so that tells you that it really is pretty old. But um, at the end, I'll, I'll try to say a few words about um, some, some current work that I'm doing to try to uh, expand and extend this this approach, um, but I picked it because it it seems to fit very well into the uh, idea of the seminar. Uh, okay. Um, so let's see. So uh, first, I wanted to give some kind of basic background for quantum computation because I know not everybody here may uh, be familiar with it. Although I guess a lot of you are. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so, uh, the idea of a quantum computer is that if you could build a computer out of very small things like single atoms, uh, the information in it would be a, a quantum mechanical state instead of what's the, the memory of a regular class computer, which is a bit string of zeros and ones. And so that means that while the, the, the qubits, the quantum bits in a quantum computer, um, have their basis states labeled by strings of zeros, zeros and ones, they can also be in superpositions of different basis states. And you can have entangled states that have non-classical correlations between multiple qubits. Um, and then if you can, you can build a quantum computer that behaves in this way, uh, we found uh, some quantum algorithms that can run only on a quantum computer that take advantage of superposition and interference to solve some problems much, much faster, exponentially faster than any known classical algorithm can do that. Factoring, um, Schwarz factoring algorithm being uh, the, the most important example of that. So um, I'm not going to talk about quantum algorithms today. Instead, I'm going to talk about something that's closely related to the question of how you build a quantum computer, although this won't go anything at all into experiments. Um, but uh, the, the idea is uh, the quantum computer, we, we take the algorithm, we break it up into a sequence of individual quantum gates. And some of those, uh, those are the gates are kind of the individual steps of a computation. And um, some of them are just quantum versions of regular classical gates that do, you know, 
the, the exclusive or between two numbers, for instance, that's the C naught gate. Um, and some of them are, are purely quantum gates that, that don't have a meaning on a, a class computer. These are gates that kind of change the basis or, or inherently involve interference and superposition. Um, but anyway, if you want to build a quantum computer, it's, it's difficult. And one reason, of course, is that manipulating single atoms is hard. But another problem is that quantum computers and qubits are just inherently going to be much more susceptible to noise than the, the bits in a regular class computer. In a regular class computer, error correction is not very important, although it is very important in classical communication. Um, but quantum computers, we think, will need some sort of error correction in order to function. So one reason for that is that qubits, well, in order to behave quantum mechanically, they just have to be very small. And something that's very small is more easily disturbed by you know, some, some, any kind of thing that happens. It's more likely to, to, to change the state. Um, so that would be true even for, for classical bits made out of single atoms. Uh, but, but beyond that, quantum states are just even more, more vulnerable than that. And the reason is that the notion of quantum superposition is inherently a very delicate one. Um, and and uh, measuring a superposition will collapse it into a, either a zero or one. Um, but it doesn't have to really have to be a measurement. It just has to be anything in the environment, even you know, some single atom that happens to be wandering by, that learns a little bit of information about this qubit. It becomes entangled with it, and that decoheres the qubit, and it destroys the superposition. And so in order to build a quantum computer, you have to isolate the qubits very, very well. But doing, you know, to the degree where you could ignore error correction is, is prohibitively hard to do. And so that's, that's one of the main reasons why we think to build a, a big quantum computer capable of running some of these algorithms, um, we're going to need quantum error correction of some sort. So what's, uh, let's go over here. Okay, what's quantum error correction? So um, quantum error correction is actually uh, mostly intended for communication for storage. And uh, the idea of quantum error correction is you have two people, Alice and Bob, and Alice wants to send some qubits to Bob. In this picture, I have one qubit, and Alice is encoding it in the quantum error correcting code by adding some extra qubits. She sends them through the communication channel, but perhaps one of them has an error. But Alice and Bob have chosen the code in such a way that Bob, on his side, can do some measurement and identify what error occurred, correct it, and then get back the original state that Alice sent. Um, so. Uh, uh, Whereas it, where if they hadn't encoded it, if the, the, the single qubit that I'll send have an error, it would just be lost to Bob. You'd have no way to get that back, um, even if you were aware that it, that it actually had an error. So, so um, however, this, this error correcting code is by itself not enough to build a quantum computer for two reasons. So one of them is the encoding and decoding steps by Alice and Bob themselves are, are small quantum computations. And the error correcting code by itself doesn't protect against errors that happen in either of those steps. So, um, so we need to be able to, to relax that assumption to let Alice and Bob have imperfect quantum computers. And moreover, instead of just transmitting a qubit from Alice to Bob, we need a way to change the encoded state in a way that's reliable and robust against errors. And so putting in these extra capabilities, that's where the idea of fault tolerant quantum computation comes in. That's a protocol that you put um, use in conjunction with a quantum error correcting code that, that kind of upgrades the code so that it, uh, it, it, it will protect against errors in the computation. Um, OK, so again, uh, some, some basic concepts for those who are not too familiar with, with quantum computing. So qubit, I mentioned that already, but, but to be a little more rigorous, a qubit is just a system with a two-dimensional Hilbert space. Sometimes you just refer to the Hilbert space, sometimes you refer to the physical system, um, but they're used kind of interchangeably in that sense. Um, and so if you have uh, uh, n qubits, then it has a two to the n-dimensional Hilbert space. Um, and uh, that kind of exponential in there uh, gives you a hint of where the quantum computer is getting its power. There's, because you can have superpositions of all these two to the n uh, different basis states. So then a quantum error correcting code is just a, a subspace of the Hilbert space of the n qubits. And we call the, the qubits that, that make up the kind of, of the error correcting code the physical qubits, the n qubits that 
that comprise the code. Um, and then there will be one or more logical qubits encoded in this error correction code. Um, uh, if you want to be very efficient, you can have many logical qubits. But for the purposes of this talk, it's enough to think about just a single logical qubit in a block of n physical qubits. And then the, the, the subspace is picked in such a way that if there's an error on a small number of the physical qubits, then you can identify that and correct it. Um, and I'm not going to go into how, to how you can, can do that, design codes that do that. But um, the, the, you can design codes that correct one error, or two errors, or three errors, or whatever. Um, but, but the cost of correcting more errors, of course, you need more physical qubits, and generally you get fewer logical qubits. So um, there's a notion of distance that kind of codifies how many errors the code can correct. And distance is the number of qubits, roughly speaking, the number of qubits you have to flip to get from one code word to a different code word, flip or change in, in some way. Um, and so a code that can correct t errors has distance 2t plus 1. Uh, I, I, as, I, as I did the talk, I find that I didn't really use the notion of distance. But we are going to think about a general quantum error correction code that can correct t errors. It's enough, really, to think about just correcting one error. Um, but, but everything I'll, I'll say will work for t errors. OK. And um, so then remember that I said a, a, a quantum computation is, is made up of single individual steps called quantum gates. And so again, being a little more rigorous, a quantum gate we generally consider to be a unitary operation that can be applied to one or more qubits. So a single qubit gate acts on one qubit, a two qubit gate acts on two qubits. Sometimes you'll have three qubit gates that act on three qubits. But generally, you won't have qubits that act, uh, gates that act on all the qubits at once. Then we consider that a more complicated quantum operation that we're supposed to build up out of gates that just act on a, on a bounded number of qubits. Um, but a quantum computation doesn't consist of just quantum gates. We need to create the initial state. Um, and so, so we need some procedure in our quantum computer that prepares a standard state, like a, a zero state for the quantum computer to, to operate on. Um, and the reason I want to be this precise and think about all the different components is because in a fault-tolerant quantum computation, we shouldn't assume that any part of the computation is perfect. Everything that we do um, has some possibility of error. Now, in what I'll be talking about, there's one exception to that, which is um, when we have classical computations that are going on on the side, we'll assume the classical computer is good enough that we can ignore the errors. That's not a necessary uh, component of of this formalism or of fault tolerant quantum computation, but it certainly simplifies things a lot. Um, so uh, yeah, and so then the, the way that you interact usually between the classical information that you might have and the quantum computation is via measurement. So measurement is a, a physical procedure that will uh, get some information about the state of the, the quantum computer. And in particular, the kind of the standard uh, von Neumann measurements that we'll be using in this talk is a projection onto either, for a single qubit, you can project a single qubit onto either the zero state or the one state. But of course, the, the whole computation, when I say it's a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space, it's a tensor product of the two qubit Hilbert spaces of the individual qubits. And so if you project one of those qubits onto zero, that will also uh, uh, potentially alter the other qubits if the, the state is actually an entangled state between the qubit that you're measuring and all the other qubits. Um, and the probability of getting the outcome zero is the norm squared of the, the, the state that you get when you project that first qubit onto zero. And the probability of getting the output one is the norm squared of the state that you get when you project onto one. And usually what happens when you, when you measure is, so the, I mean, I said the, 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 the qubit is a two-dimensional Hilbert space. It's actually a projective Hilbert space. The global phase doesn't matter. And we nor normally usually normalize the state so that they have norm one. So that means that the total probability of something happening is one. Um, and so after measurement, we usually renormalize to, to take that into account and to make that true again. Um, and then the measurement, of course, also has to produce, give you some classical information about what is going on. And so that's the, the a classical bit that, that comes out of the measurement. And finally, a quantum circuit is just a sequence of state preparations, quantum gates, and measurements. Um, OK, so maybe this is a good point to pause for questions on the basic uh, concepts.
Okay, I think everybody's up to speed. Okay, good. Um, okay, so um, so now let's talk about uh, fault tolerant quantum computing. So, what is a fault tolerant protocol? So, basically, a fault tolerant protocol is this encoding, one that takes um, ideal circuit C, these are the, the quantum gates and quantum circuits that you want to implement, and maps them to some fault tolerant encoding of that C prime. And then uh, the, the C prime will, will, will end with some series of measurements that gives you some classical bits. And then the output of those classical bits, those output bits, uh, there should be a decoding algorithm that uh, uh, gives you some uh, output distribution. That, and that's the overall output distribution of the fault tolerant computation. Um, and the, and if, there, if there were no errors, then you want the output of this decoded computation to be the same as the, as the output distribution of the original ideal circuit C. That's what tells you that C prime is actually representing C in a meaningful sense. Now, you don't really have to have it be exactly the same. You could have it be the same up to, up to you know, very high fidelity. But um, uh, generally, in fact, the fault tolerant computations we consider do give exactly the same if there are no errors. If there are errors, they won't give exactly the same because there's some possibility of an error that the, the fault tolerant protocol can't handle. Um, but, but they should still be close, and that's the, the goal of fault tolerance. Um, and and um, these encoding and decoding maps should be efficient. They should be polynomial time in, when you get to very large circuits, so that you're not kind of hiding uh, important computation in the, the circuit encoding, where you, you switch from C to C prime, or in the decoding, where you take C prime and then get out the actual answer, right? Because you could say, oh, well, I'm actually just gonna ignore the output of C prime, and instead I'm gonna do some gigantic classical computation that solves this problem and give out the answer there. That's cheating. Okay, so, um, so uh, that's the, the basic framework of fault tolerance, but usually we, we go a little bit further and, and think about fault tolerance protocols that have a very specific form. And so the way it works is you take each single qubit in your original circuit and you replace that by a quantum error correcting code. So that the, log, the, the, the qubit in the original circuit C becomes the log qubit of this quantum error correcting code. You can also take groups of qubits and encode them, um, multiple groups in the same block of the code. Uh, but that's, that's uh, uh, a little more advanced and complicated. So um, the, the the, then you have to take the the, the elements of the <coughs> the elements of the circuit, which actually in the original paper we called locations, and usually I call locations, but for some reason in this talk I decided to call them circuit elements, and those are the state preparations, the gates, and the measurements in that in that circuit C, and each one of those is replaced by something called a gadget, and the gadget uh, is supposed to implement some version of that state preparation gate or measurement on the quantum error correcting code, okay? And I'll make that precise in a little bit, exactly what it means to, to do uh, uh, an encoded version of these things. Um, and then we also need to, to throw in some, some additional gadgets which are used for error correction, right? Because as the computation is going along, we'll have some errors. And if we just wait until the end to worry about that, the errors will accumulate. And over the course of a very long computation, we won't, the errors will build up uh, beyond the point where we can actually correct them with the error correcting code. There'll be too many errors for the code to correct. And so we should stop periodically and do error correction. And usually in, in uh, analyses, people just kind of put in error correction gadgets after every other gadget. Um, so that really stops the errors from building up quickly. Uh, but you don't, again, don't have to do that. Okay. so. Um, so that, that tells you the structure of the, the circuit encoding and the structure of the fault tolerant protocol, but we still haven't gotten to the point where we actually have a condition that we've put in that says that it really is fault tolerant. And so that's the, the next step. But before I do that, are there, are there questions on this? People should remember they have to unmute if they want to ask a question. Um, just to let people know you can unmute easily by just holding the space bar. Okay, so if there's no questions, let's go on. Um, so, okay, so uh, 
the uh, the the before I before I um, uh, get to talking about fault tolerance, let me just how we'll model the errors in the system. So um, so the uh, the encoded circuit. Um, remember, we're we're mapping the C into C prime, and so C prime is made up of of gates as well. So I'm going to call those physical gates, um, and each of those physical gates can sometimes do the wrong thing. So in, this, in the simplest model, we'll just assume that each of them independently has, the prob has, has some probability P of doing the wrong thing. And that's called a fault when that happens. And with probably one minus P, it does exactly what it's supposed to. Um, and so if you have a gate with a fault, then what happens is, so that's re represented by this uh, red controlled not gate here. Um, then uh, it's replaced, it, it, it's equivalent to having the perfect gate, which is unitary, followed by some error on the qubits involved in the gate. So an assumption here is that you know, a faulty gate doesn't produce errors on different qubits, it only produces errors on the qubits in the gate. Um, and, um, <coughs> and the, but the rest of it is not really an assumption, because we're allowing kind of arbitrary quantum operations to happen on these two qubits. And the fact that we can pull out this perfect gate is possible just because the gate is unitary. So we can, the, the, this red part here is just, this gate here is u, and this red part here is, is u dagger times the original faulty gate. Um, okay, so, and then the most general thing that can happen to a quantum state, again, some, some basic quantum uh, computation ideas, is a completely positive trace preserving map. So I'm not going to define that completely, but that's the most general quantum operation. It's something that acts on the density matrix of the state, and it can be written as an operation that takes rho into sum of k, uh, ak rho ak dagger. And there's a condition on the ak's, which is that sum of ak dagger ak is equal to the identity. Um, so that's called the Krauss decomposition, and the, the ak's are called the Krauss operators. Um, and if you want to think in pure states, as I often do, then, um, then uh, the, the state psi, if it was psi before the error, then if you have the error, you can think of it ha of, of just getting one of these AKs, and you'll get AK psi as the state after the error. So I should say this, uh, um, this is a little bit disingenuous. This is not actually the most completely general thing that can happen in the circumstance, because um, the, the completely positive trace preserving map assumes that the quantum computer is interacting with an environment which is in a tensor product, initially in a tensor product with your quantum computer. Um, and the thing is that when you have many gates, each of which can have faults, that might not be true. There might be an environment that kind of persists throughout the computation. And so errors on later gates can interact with the same environment as the earlier gates did. Um, and uh, so that's called a non-Markovian uh, environment, it's, it's a little more difficult to deal with, um, and we can't completely deal with it, in fact. But um, you can kind of upgrade the, the, the proof that I'll be showing you to, to show that for quite a wide range of non-Markovian uh, noise models, um, the, the, the fault tolerance still works. OK, so yeah, so, so now let's start to get into the pictures. I mean, I guess I should say, that the, uh, the, the gate circuit, the gate networks that I was showing you mostly as decoration on the previous slides are already kind of a picture language that, that is just completely widespread in the field of quantum computation. Um, so what I'm gonna, gonna talk about starting now is a more specialized language that's, that was designed for fault tolerance. And actually the, these pictures are not as such in the original paper that I mentioned, although we have some kind of text graphic versions of them. Um, but, but uh, you know, there's no really reason to have the text version. It's, it's nicer and just as illustrative to have the, the pictures. So, okay, so there's kind of two semantic concepts that we want to encode with our, with our picture language here. And so one of them is we want to say that a quantum state has R physical errors on it. So what that means is we have an error correcting code and there's, there's R physical errors relative to the code space. Um, and so we do that with a, something that, that we call an R filter, which is a projector onto the subspace, which is spanned 
by the quantum error correcting code. So the code that have ar arbitrary r qubit errors on them. Um, and it's enough actually to just to think about r qubit poly errors, which is this form of basis for the space of uh, 2 to the r by 2 to the r dimensional matrices. So anyway, so this, this projector then uh, kind of takes out the part of this, the state that has only r errors. So, so we can say that a state has r errors on it if you stick it in to uh, this filter and it comes out unchanged. And so in the picture language, the thick brown line here is going to represent a state of a, of a quantum error correcting code. So it's a, 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 a logical qubit encoded in uh, one block of n qubits. That's the error correcting code. Um, it might or might not have errors on it. And then this, uh, this vertical rectangle with, uh, is, is an R filter with R labeled at the top here. Um, and then the other semantic concept that, that we need is the idea of what is the logical state of the computer? What is the, the value of the logical qubit? Um, and that's you know, relatively clear and straightforward when there's no errors in the system, but it's a little less clear when there are errors. Um, and so we need a canonical way of mapping states with errors into a logical qubit. Otherwise, we won't be able to talk about what happens to the logical qubit at all. And so we do this with something called the ideal decoder. So the ideal decoder is not something that you can implement physically, but it's a mathematical operation that takes the decoding procedure of the error correcting code, corrects the error, corrects the errors, and then decodes to the logical qubit. And uh, what makes it ideal is that you do all this stuff with, with quantum gates that don't have any errors in them. That's, so that's the thing that you can't do in the real world. Um, but it's a, a very nice conceptual tool that lets us talk about what the logical qubit is, the thing that we would get if we put it through this ideal decoder. Um, and so then the ideal decoder I'll represent by this triangle and the ideal decoder qubit by the thinner green line. OK, so there are questions on the R filter and the ideal decoder. Now we're starting to get into the actual meat of the talk. So I want people to understand that part. I think people are very interested in the mathematical structure. OK, OK, so let's, let's keep going. So more pictures. So um, yeah, so then um, what we're, we're going to need to, to actually start to to draw the more interesting pictures is um, pictures for the different kinds of gadgets. And so in particular, I'll represent the gate gadgets. So they're acting on a logical qubit. So they have thick brown lines, and it's going to be a brown circle. And then if the gate gadget is made up of, of a bunch of individual physical gates, then it, those can have faults. And so if the gate gadget has R faults, I'll write the R up here. And then similarly, the preparation gadget is going to be this half circle. Um, and with an R labeling how many faults, the measurement gadget a half circle in the opposite direction. And the error correction gadget is just going to be a square. And I put DC in it to help remind you that it's an error correction gadget. And again, all those things can have R faults. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, ideal gates, ideal preparations, and ideal measurements. And those will just be um, green versions of the same pictures. And so each of these pictures that I'm going to draw represents a completely positive phase preserving map because it's the quantum operations that I want to, to, to do, but the, the, the individual physical circuit, circuit elements can be replaced by faulty ones. And so that means that, that even you know, a gate gadget is not going to be necessarily unitary. It's going to be a, a completely positive map that might take pure states into mixed states because of the absence of the errors. OK, so, so once we have all these pictures, we can start to define what it means to be fault tolerant. And um, in particular, these, these are, there's going to be two properties that a gate gadget should satisfy, um, but, but they don't have to satisfy in the most general cases. We're going to have two uh, kind of error components, one coming from the incoming state, and that will have R errors. And then there'll be faults, S faults, in the gadget itself. And so we expect these properties to hold when R plus S is less than equal to T. T, again, is the number of errors that the quantum error correcting code that we're using can correct. So that's kind of the limit of, of how much we should expect to work. If you have more than T errors, we don't expect the error correcting code to work, and we don't expect these properties to hold. So these two properties, one of them is a, an error propagation property, the gate propagation property. 
And what this says is that if you put the input state through an R filter, and then you do the gate gadget with S faults, then that's equivalent to doing the same thing and then putting the output through an R plus S filter. So the fact that we can, we can uh, add this R plus S filter and we still have equality, we haven't changed anything, means that the state that's coming out of this gate gadget has at most R plus S errors. So the R filter is used to guarantee that the input state has only R errors, and then we get kind of S new errors from the gate gadget. And we're saying, but the thing is that in a fault tolerant circuit, um, errors can propagate. You could have some, some gate that, uh, you know, if that gate is faulty, it causes errors on many, many qubits uh, later on. And so this property is saying that that doesn't happen. Or at least if it happens, then we've somehow gotten rid of those extra errors. We just have a single uh, fault in a gate that only produces one extra error in the output state. Daniel, may I ask a question? Yes. This is Ike. Hi. Um, I'm curious. Uh, hi, Daniel. I'm curious how much of what you've described um, so far uh, needs to be quantum, because much of the logic you just described is very classical. Yeah, so almost nothing about this is quantum, in fact. It's, um, um, yeah, and I was going to comment on that at the end, but I can, I can do it now, which is just that basically the whole language that I'm presenting works just as well for classical fault tolerance, and it should work for fault tolerance in some completely different physical theory that somebody might make up later. Um, there is you know, some properties of locality you need. Um, obviously, I have this, the, the idea of a measurement, and classical computation is something that is specific to quantum computation, but most of it should hold true. Great, thank you. Yeah. OK. So, um, and then the second property is a gate correctness property. And so the gate correctness property says that, okay, suppose we have a state, it passes through an R filter to guarantee it has only R errors. And then we do the, the gate gadget with S faults. So then suppose we take that thing and we put it through an ideal decoder. So we're saying the logical state that comes out after the gate gadget, well, the gate gadget should be doing the logical gate, right? So what that means is that if we, that should be the same as if we take the original state that passed through the filter, stick it into this ideal decoder right away, and then do the gate on the ideal uncoded qubit. Um, and those, those two things being the same tells us that the, the logical state of the encoded qubit changes in a way that's consistent with the gate we wanted to perform. Okay. And these properties should hold for arbitrary sets of S faults. Okay? It's not that there's some particular set of S faults that for which this works. It has to hold no matter what fault you have, provided there's the, the total number of faults and errors, R plus S is less than equal to T. Okay? Any other questions on these properties? Okay, so, um, so now let's talk about the fault tolerant properties for the other kinds of gadgets. So they're very similar. Um, state preparation, again, has a propagation property, the preparation propagation property, and a preparation correctness property. The propagation property, well, there's no incoming error to a state preparation gadget. So, um, so all we have here is that if you do the state preparation gadget with R faults, um, that should be equal to the, state to the state preparation gadget with R faults. Oh, I guess one thing I do want to say is that the, when we have the, the, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the set of faults is the same on both sides. So, um, uh, uh, so we can compare them directly. Obviously, um, you wouldn't expect them to be exactly the same operations if you had different faults on the left and the right. Anyway, so the, but the point is that the state is unchanged when you put it through an R filter, and therefore it has only R errors. In it. And then the correctness property says that if you take the output of this ideal, uh, sorry, this state preparation gadget and stick it into an ideal decoder, then you get the ideal state preparation. The measurement doesn't have a propagation property because while well, you can have errors that are, oh, I didn't write the right thing here. Um, here, let me, let me see if I can fix it right here. Uh, 
So there's supposed to be an R filter here. And then this thing here, we'd say yes. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the measurement correctness property, um, if you have a state that's coming in with R errors, well, there's no output state. So there's no, uh, there's no propagation property for measurement because we're assuming the classical bits are perfect. Um, but uh, there is a correctness property, which is that if you have a state coming in with R errors and you have the gadget with S faults, then that's the same as doing the ideal decoder and then doing the measurement on ideal, a perfect measurement on the, the uh, decoded logical qubit. OK. Um, so the thing that uh, is a little bit different is the, the fault tolerance properties for the error correction gadget. So in particular, and this time I didn't make a mistake, the error correction recovery property says that um, if you have this error correction gadget with R uh, faults in it, then the, the, it should remain unchanged if you stick it, the output through an, an R filter. And in particular, I, there's no requirement to have a filter on the input state. So normally with these gadgets, I want to assume that the total number of incoming errors plus errors in the gadget doesn't exceed the capability of the, the code to correct them. In this case, I'm not assuming that. I mean, I'm not, I don't have to worry about that. Um, and in particular, you know, if I could have a state, the incoming state with arbitrarily many errors, I still want the error correction procedure to bring it back to something that's close in the sense of, of, of having distance is close in, in, in the number of errors on the state uh, to, the, to an actual code word. Now, of course, if there's lots of errors coming in, it won't be the, the right code word, whatever that means, um, but it will, it will be a code word, or at least uh, are errors away from a code word. Uh, and the reason we want that is because otherwise, you have a very big circuit, and due to some fluctuation, there's a bad error where you have lots of, lots of errors, lots of faults all at once. Uh, well, the error correcting code will fail at that point, and so the logical state will change. But you still want to kind of be able to recover and have the rest of the circuit do the right thing. Um, that's that's uh, particularly important if you want to concatenate this code with another code, because otherwise, um, in order to get better error correction uh, properties, um, because otherwise, you know, if, you're, if your code is failing at some point, it, it needs to kind of still behave mostly correctly later in, in order to, to, to get to kind of salvage some, something out of it. Anyway, so the, the other property then is a, is a correctness property, the error correction correctness property. And that does look a lot like the other ones, the correctness properties, in that we have the input state goes through an R filter um, to ensure that it has only has R errors in it. And then we have the error correction gadget with S faults. Then we do an ideal decoder. And of course, the error correction gadget should not change the encoded state. So we want that to be equal to just putting the state through the R filter and then immediately doing the ideal decoder. Um, and again, for this, so this time we will have the condition that R plus S is less than equal to T, because otherwise, you can't really expect the error correction gadget to work. Um, if you had you know, many, many errors coming in, um, then, well, the error correction gadget has a few faults, and it might be that, you know, combined with the previous errors, the new errors that occur at the beginning of the error correction might occur at the beginning of the error correction gadget and change the encoded state relative to what it was before the gadget. Um, uh, and, and so this, this thing would then not hold. But with, uh, with the R filter in front, that guarantees that the total number of errors doesn't build up beyond what the code can correct. And then we do expect the error correction gadget to keep the encoded state the same. OK. So, um, so. Can I ask so, a question about yeah. the last slide? Sure. S sorry to uh, interject. Um, so, I, I, I certainly see that this is a great um, property that you uh, want to define so that you can have a um, systematic understanding of error correction. What about the case when there's a flag that you want the error correction operator to raise when it knows it failed, but uh, can't do much so that you can pop the error up to another level like a concatenation? Um, yeah, so this language doesn't, doesn't capture stuff like that. So this is just kind of, this language was designed for kind of the most basic, the, the sort of the oldest 
uh, fault tolerant uh, procedures um, and and doesn't really capture too much of the additional stuff. So that's that sort of thing I, I hope to capture in with this work in progress. Um, but basically you can you can that that part is not too hard. You can have some side classical computation, some, some side computation that kind of influences the way you you, you do stuff um, but doesn't otherwise dramatically change the language. Okay? Okay, great. Thank you. Are there are there other questions on these properties? Actually, I did have one more, if you okay. don't mind. The, uh, on the slide previous to this one, you said you assumed that classical bits have no errors. And it got yeah. me to thinking, what, what if you wanted to have both uh, erroneous classical and erroneous quantum at the same time? Would your model be able to handle that um, and so that we um, forego that? Yeah, I mean, because, because there's no, I mean, again, I'm not really using any particular quantum properties here. It's just, um, um, th so that the, the measurement gadget, as I've, you know, described it, it converts between uh, a noisy classical bit, uh, sorry, uh, an, uh, an encoded uh, quantum system and a perfect unencoded classical system. But um, you could have it have an output that's, first of all, it could be a kind of a non-demolition measurement that has an output encoded quantum bit or you could have it have a uh, encoded classical bit output. That doesn't dramatically change anything. You just have to you know, put extra filters on the outputs and then you, then you will have a propagation property to ensure that those things don't accumulate extra errors. Um, it's not, it's just like, you know, this is designed for the, for the kind of the, the, again, the simplest types of fault tolerant protocols where you don't have all these variations. Got it, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so um, so so now let's get to more complicated pictures. Um, so suppose we have a big quantum circuit and we've encoded it as a fault tolerant circuit. So um, so that consists of a of a long series of of preparation gadgets and uh, gate gadgets and measurement gadgets. Um, and we've interspersed them with, with error correction gadgets. Let's suppose we do it one after one error correction gadget after every other kind of gadget. So the circuit looks a little bit like this, right? Error correction, gadget, gate gadget, error correction gadget, gate gadget, error correction gadget. Now, in order to analyze how this behaves, we don't really want to have to look at this whole giant circuit, which could be extremely large. We'd like to look at very small pieces of it, pieces of bounded size. Um, and in particular, um, we're going to break it up into what's called an extended rectangle, which is represented by these, these dotted uh, line boxes. Um, and an extended rectangle consists of a gate gadget, or a preparation or measurement gadget, and the error correction gadgets before and after it. So um, in this case, we have a, a gate gadget affecting a single block of the code, a single logical qubit, and so it has two error correction gadgets. This tape preparation gadget, we only have one error correction gadget after it, but a gate gadget that was a two qubit gate gadget, so it had two blocks of the code, would have two error correction gadgets before it and two error correction gadgets after it. So the extended rectangle would then consist of the gate gadget plus four error correction gadgets. So that's another reason to kind of restrict attention to gadgets that act on as few qubits as possible. If you had a gate gadget that was acting on 20 qubits, then you know you need 20 error correction gadgets before and 20 after it. So the extended rectangle would be very big. Um, as you, and as you see, you, you want to kind of avoid that. So, um, so, so the, the logic behind doing this is that um, if you have errors that are occurring kind of late in one of the error correction gadgets, well, then they'll be picked up in the other error correction gadget. And so you can't have too many errors that kind of pass all the way through uh, this extended rectangle without, without, without being detected. Um, um, but on the other hand, if you have errors in, in this error correction gadget that are late in this error correction gadget and more faults that are early in this error correction gadget, then they can potentially combine and cause a problem. So what we want is we're gonna say that the extended rectangles shouldn't have too many errors in them. And in particular, we say extended rectangle is good if there's at most T faults anywhere in this rectangle, in the, in the extended rectangle. Um, 
where again, is the code can correct T errors. And if it's not good, of course, it's bad. And the idea then is that a good extended rectangle could kind of do the right thing. And I'll say what that is in a moment more precisely, um, whereas a bad, bad extended rectangle might do something else. So one complication in this approach is that these extended rectangles, um, because they include the error correction gadgets before and after, um, that they overlap with each other. And so that, that causes a complication, which I'll say just a very little bit about um, uh, later on. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, so what does it mean that an extended rectangle is doing the right thing? So, so I wanted to find that rigorously as uh, using these pictures um, by saying that uh, uh, extended rectangle is correct if the following happens. So for a gate extended rectangle, you have the extended rectangle followed by an ideal decoder. And it's correct if this is equal to kind of the, the leading uh, error correction gadget followed immediately by an ideal decoder, and then with um, uh, an, an ideal gate applied to the decoded qubit. So again, both sides here are completely positive trace preserving maps. So this is a statement about the equality of, C of two CPTP maps. And the faults on the left-hand side are supposed to be the same, exactly the same as the faults on the right-hand side. In the case where the specific location is present on both the left and the right. So for instance, the faults in this leading error correction gadget are the same as the faults in this error correction gadget on the right-hand side. But the faults in the gate gadget and the, the trailing error correction gadget are not present at all on the right-hand side because those things have been replaced by ideal gates. Um, and so, so that's why this is a pretty non-trivial statement because it's saying that no matter what errors occur, what faults occur in the, in the later part of this, this extended rectangle, this is still equal to the same thing here. Um, and um, the, the correctness for preparation and measurement are kind of the same, um, but, but turn out a little bit differently. But in particular, if you have a preparation gadget followed by an EC, so that's a preparation extended rectangle, and you immediately do an ideal decoder, that's the same as just preparing the ideal state. And um, so this thing kind of eats up the ideal decoder. And then if you have a, a measurement extended rectangle, which is uh, an error correction followed by a measurement gadget, that's the same as the error correction followed by a deal decoder followed by perfect measurement. Questions on the correctness properties? Okay, so, um, Anyway, so I've been just doing a lot of definitions. So let's, let's get to a proof. So, and, and we can do that just using uh, the, the various properties that I said. Oh, I guess one thing I wanted to say. So I've defined what it means for these gadgets to be fault tolerant. And of course, it's a whole other thing to actually come up with a, 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 an actual you know, sequence of gates that satisfy these properties. We can do that. We know how to, we know how to do that. There's lots of different uh, fault tolerant gate constructions. Um, some of them kind of lie outside this framework, as, as uh, suggested by, by Ike's question. Um, but a lot of them can be put into this framework. And then you can show that they, they, they actually do satisfy these properties. But I'm not going to do that. That's, that's a whole other talk. And that's actually probably more than one hour. Yeah, in my class, I spend probably you know, six or something class hours describing these fault tolerant uh, gadgets. So just assume that there's a way of doing this. And then what I want to prove right now is that if you satisfy these properties, then um, a, a good extended rectangle, one that has not uh, at most t errors in it, is correct. And you'll see that it's a really very simple proof just applying these pictures. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an extended rectangle. And we're, I'm just going to do it for the gate gadget case because the other ones are similar. Um, and so we have the leading error correction gadget, which we'll say has R1 faults the gate gadget, which has S faults, and the crawling error correction gadget, which has R2 faults. And because the extended rectangle is good, that means that R1 plus R2 plus S is less than or equal to T. Okay? And so now let's take the left-hand side of this picture and try to convert it into the right-hand side using, using the, the various fault-tolerant properties that we have. So left-hand side, we have the extended rectangle followed by the ideal decoder. Now, the first thing we want to do 
um, all those different properties involved filters, right? Every single one of them had a filter on the input except for the error correction property, the error correction recovery property. And that said, we can take an error correction gadget with R1 faults and stick a filter after it, an R1 filter after it without changing anything. So let's do that. Um, and now we can, we can move that filter forward um, or not exactly move it forward, but add another filter after the gate gadget by using the gate propagation property. And that says if you have an R1 filter, S faults, then we, have a, we can stick in afterwards an R1 plus S filter. And again, there's a remember there's a condition for that, which is that R1 plus S is less than or equal to T. But since R1 plus R2 plus S is less than or equal to T, that's satisfied. Okay, so now if you look at this combination here, filter, error correction, ideal decoder, that's the thing that appeared in the error correction correctness property. And, and uh, when R1 plus S plus R2 is less than or equal to T, which is, is true here, then the error correction correctness property says that you can push this ideal decoder back and, and eliminate the error correction like that. Okay, so now we'd like to continue to push this ideal decoder back through this gate gadget, but we can't because the, that uses the gate correctness property, which says, oh, we have a filter, we have a gate gadget, we have the ideal decoder. There's an extra filter in the way. We have to get rid of it. And we can do that by using the gate propagation property in reverse. Remember it said that we could put it, stick in an ideal, uh, sorry, stick in a filter and it wouldn't change anything. Well, that means we can also take away the filter and it won't change anything. <coughs> so we're going from the right-hand side of the gate preparation property to the left-hand side. Now we have the combination that we want, the gate correctness property. And so we can push the ideal decoder back through and get the ideal gate. And then we're almost at the right-hand side of, of the correctness equation, but we still have this extra filter. And so we can get rid of it using the, the error correction recovery property in reverse. Okay, so that's the proof. That, that proved that a good extended rectangle, one without too many faults, is correct. Any questions on that? Um, uh, just one, this is like, again, so that goes in one direction. This is uh, therefore sufficient, but um, not necessary, right? Um, yes, right. You could, have, you could have a correct rectangle that is not good. That's true. And in fact, in our original paper, we took advantage of that to say, well, there's some patterns of faults that have more than T errors, we were, we were analyzing a distance three code so that, that have more than one error, more than one fault in a, in a rectangle, but can never, you know, for these particular locations, the, the extended rectangle can never fail, that, that it will always be correct. Um, and that means that there's fewer opportunities for the, for the circuit to fail and that you have therefore more tolerance to error in the protocol. So could I ask a question? How, how would you build a good quantum extended rectangle? Um, well, what do you mean by a good one? So, uh, you mean how to guarantee that it has only T errors? Sorry, you're not, if you're, okay. So the, I mean, you don't, you can't guarantee that it has only T errors, um, because the errors are occurring randomly in this, in this error model. Um, but in a minute, uh, I'll, I'll talk about but there's some, the, the point is that there's some probability that you get a, a correct rectangle. And because the code can correct one error, suppose the code can correct one error, um, so t is equal to one, well, the probability of getting two errors in the, in the extended rectangle is order p squared. So it's, it's generally smaller, and one p is small. But right. I'm not sure if that was answering the question or not. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, so yeah, so another proof. So, so in particular, if all the extended rectangles in the circuit are good, then um, we can prove that the fault tolerance circuit is equivalent to the ideal unencoded circuit. And so that's kind of the goal of fault tolerance, right? It's, it's showing that even though we have this big circuit that has faults in it, provided the faults are distributed, are not kind of concentrated too much in any one place, so there's not too many faults in any extended rectangle, then the circuit is actually doing what it's supposed to, that the output distribution here is the same after this decoding as the output distribution if we could implement the unencoded circuit perfectly. So how do we do that? Well, 
you know, most of our correctness properties had ideal decoders in them. Um, but the, 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 the measurement correctness property, sorry, okay, it's a little weird. So, so if you have a, a measurement extended rectangle, that allowed us to kind of create an ideal decoder. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use that property to create an ideal decoder. Then we're going to push the ideal decoder back to the other extended rectangles to turn it into the ideal circuit. So, um, so, so right. So this uh, measurement extended rectangle by assumption is, is good. So therefore, it's correct. Um, and so what that means is we can, we can take it and convert it by making the ideal decoder here and then an ideal measurement. And then we have the situation that where we can apply the correctness property to this extended rectangle. When we do that, we get an ideal gate. And the, the ideal decoder has been pushed back further. And so we can apply the correctness property to this extended rectangle. And we push it back further, get another ideal gate. And finally, we have the correctness property for this uh, uh, preparation extended rectangle. We do that, and it, it eats up the ideal decoder. We're left with just the original uncoded circuit. Uh, and all these things are, are ideal gates, so the, the output, and, and, and this is equal to the original um, uh, uh, fault-tolerant circuit that we had, even though it had some faults in it. Okay, so that's proving that that, that we're doing the right thing. Okay, but what happened, what's, so what is the probability of having uh, tangle being good? Well, um, if, if, the, if the extended rectangle has A locations, A circuit elements in it, um, each one of them has, is failing with probability P. And so the, the, the probability of any particular set of T plus one, circuit elements having faults in them is p to the t plus 1. And there's a q's t plus 1 different sets of, of t plus 1 faults. So the probability of having a bad extended rectangle is at most a q's t plus 1 p to the t plus 1. Um, of course, there, there could be more than t plus 1 faults. Um, but any set of you know, t plus 2 faults has lots of subsets of size t plus 1 all over the output. So things that have t plus 2 or more faults are multiple counted here. That's why it's a less than or equal to. Um, OK, so, so um, when p is small, this is an improvement. So that's, that's what I said before. And that's why this is really fault tolerant, fault tolerant, because the probability of having a, a fault in the, or having, having the, the Having all the, the extended rectangles be correct is larger um, you know, when p is small enough than the probability of getting through your whole original circuit without having any errors. That was just something that was linear in p. Now we have something that's quadratic or higher order in p. Um, but we would like to say something a bit stronger. We would like to say that um, we can take uh, an extended rectangle that has, that's bad um, and when it's followed by an ideal decoder, we could push that ideal decoder through. And OK, we don't expect in that case to get an ideal gate. But we might be able to expect to get a gate that has some fault on it, right? And so then we could say, well, actually, this, um, this encoded version of the, the circuit is equivalent to a circuit that has faults in it, but at a lower rate, right? That are an error rate that's, that's like this, h to the t plus 1, p to the t plus 1, instead of the original p. Um, but unfortunately, that's not true. And the reason it's not true is that the fault that occurs here can depend not just on and the faults that are that are in this kind of apparent in this picture, but can also depend on the errors that come in from the previous extended rectangle. And the reason that's a problem is because while well, the left hand side of the picture <coughs> knows all the faults that occurred in this extended rectangle. The right-hand side doesn't. It knows the faults that occurred here. Those are still present on the right-hand side. But the faults that are in this gate gadget and this error correction gadget, those have all kind of been subsumed into a single fault that's in this faulty gate. And, um, and there's a loss of information because different errors that are coming in combine different faults to 
produce different errors here. And there's no way to capture that on the right-hand side, upgrade our decoder to keep track of the error information that we have. And that's called the star decoder. And it has an extra output, which is this, um, the, the syndrome information of, uh, that describes what the, the error is that the ideal decoder found. Um, and once we do that, we can push this ideal decoder back through the, the, the extended rectangle. Um, and then the fault um, that, we, that we get on the decoded qubit depends, it's, no, it's not really ideal anymore, um, depends on the, the uh, syndrome information, on the error information. The syndrome information also changes um, to kind of take into account um, the, the error propagation and the, the new faults that occurred here. Um, but the upshot is that you still get some kind of equality. It's just one that has this extra red line in there. Um, and then once you do that, you can kind of uh, uh, modify uh, all the pictures to, to use the star decoders instead of the original ideal decoders. Um, and then do the same kind of argument to show that a circuit that has um, some good rectangles and some bad rectangles can replace the, the good rectangles with ideal gates and the bad extended rectangles with faulty gates. Now, there is one additional complication, which is, uh, which is a kind of annoying one, which is because these extended rectangles overlap, um, if we have a lot of faults in one of the error correction gadgets, that could potentially cause two extended rectangles to be bad. And if we, if we translated it the, the, the most naive way, that would mean that we have a correlated error in the, after, after we push this ideal decoder back through. And we, we want to annoy that. We'll, we want to avoid that. Um, we'll still have some correlations, but we can do that by pushing this ideal decoder back past this original, uh, this star decoder back through the, back past the original leading one. Um, when you have a bad as we have a fault here, it, it doesn't really cause any extra harm to do that. Whereas if it was a good extended rectangle, um, that, would, that would cause the property to fail. Um, anyway, the upshot is that we can replace the fault tolerant circuit with an equivalent unencoded circuit that has error rate that's at most a choose g plus one to the p times p to the g plus one. Uh, and so that's, that's really the statement of fault tolerance. And then you can use this property to very quickly prove the threshold theorem by concatenating this property and letting the, by, by you take a fault tolerant protocol, you encode it again using a fault tolerant protocol, and so on. And that drives this error rate down very rapidly to zero. OK, um, so I've kind of run out of time. So let me very quickly say something about the work in progress. So what I'd like to do is, is upgrade um, this, this uh, picture language to take into account a wider variety of fault tolerant protocols, also fault on protocols in particular, the, the most interesting case maybe is fault on protocols that are designed for specific kinds of errors, right? If you have some kinds of errors that are more common than others, you'd like to have use an error correcting code that's better at correcting the common errors, maybe worse at correcting others. Um, but, but the current approach treats all errors as equally bad and doesn't, doesn't make any kind of distinction. And so my thoughts of how to do this is we replace the, the lowercase r filter with an uppercase r filter. So r is now a set of errors. And so the, the, then if we have a propagation property, it would look something like this. We have uh, the, the uppercase R filter, and then we have a set S of faults. And those things uh, combine, and so the, the output has to pass through some, some filter as well, or this equivalent to passing through some filter, which is a function F of RS. It's yet a, another set of errors um, that could possibly be on the state. And the idea is then that these, these functions F has to satisfy some composition properties so that when you, you put gadgets together, the errors don't accumulate beyond the ability of the error correcting code to correct. Now, I should say that I have a lot of ideas about the, this, but it's very hard to kind of fit all them together and make a, a coherent theory out of it. So that's why it's work in progress and not something that's done. OK, so yeah, just to conclude, um, the, the, this, this picture language lets us look at just small segments of a circuit and analyze them independently. And that makes it much easier to analyze whether a gadget is actually fault tolerant or not, rather than having to look at the whole big circuit and see whether you know, all possible combinations of gadgets will work together in a way that, 
that does work or that causes problems. Um, and the picture language is a very natural way to, to capture the relationship between the errors and the faults uh, and between the physical and the logical qubits. Um, and as I said before, this is not specific to quantum mechanics. It could also work with classical fault tolerance. Uh, but, but, but I would like to upgrade this picture language um, and, and cover more types of things, uh, but, but that, that seems to be challenging. OK, so thanks. That's it. Let me maybe stop sharing and see if we can take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. And now uh, the floor is open to questions. Um, this is Ike again. Maybe I can follow up with one of my questions. The, um, by the way, uh, really nice work. As you know, this XREC has entered the lexicon for the whole field. And um, my question is actually about that. Do you think there's any plausibility of having a theory which uh, doesn't have the overlap? Because the overlap turns into problems for many, many other parts. Um, yes and no. So, OK, so there's two things. Uh, two or three thoughts about that. So, um, so the first one is actually we have had in our original paper uh, a version of this picture language that that worked without the overlap um, that followed the lines of the 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 the, the proof by um, Harnoff and Ben Orr. Um, but the problem is when you do that, you need codes that correct more errors. So right. you can you only you have you have rectangles instead of extended rectangles. But you um, you only allow one fault in the rectangle, but your code still has to correct two errors, and so that's kind of a waste. And it means that if you actually try to calculate a threshold based on that, you get much worse numbers. Um, and it never seemed plausible that that was actually correct. And so that's that's kind of the motivation for the way we did it. Um, now the way the way we did it is to get rid of all the filters, and so the extended rectangle doesn't have any filter; it just has this ideal decoder being pushed back through it. So I think if you, if you want to, to kind of shrink the extended rectangle to get rid of that, you have to keep the filters in. Um, and I think in the general case, I probably will have to do that. I haven't, I haven't been able to, to really figure out a way around that. Um, and that's going to make everything more complicated. Um, but, but it will allow you to kind of shrink the rectangle to have only the, the gate and the error correction gadget in it. And that's actually helpful when you want to look at more general things because, um, for instance, if you use like nil, uh, nil's techniques for doing kind of combining uh, teleportation and error correction, you can also do gates at the same time that you're doing the error correction. But that means that they're not separate things. And so that also causes problems for the formalism as I presented it because um, you'd like to have a separate error correction gadget from the gate gadget. I mean, in the in the formalism in the picture language, um, but if you but if they if they get combined, then you there's kind of some extra redundancy because you have to combine two gate gadgets into a single extended rectangle. Well, um, what I was thinking is that you since you went on ahead and introduced the star decoder uh, mm -hmm. way back then, maybe those feed forwards could also be used to circumvent the need for overlap. Um, well, I mean, you, still need, you still need to apply some kind of filter, whether it's before or after the star decoder doesn't really matter because the star decoder is unitary. Um, but you need some filter to kind of guarantee that you don't have too many errors coming in from before. And that makes yeah. it a little more complicated to kind of paste these two things together. I should say that, um, that doing it that way is a bit more similar to Ben Reichardt's proof that also used distance three codes. Um, right. He had some kind of more complicated way of tracking what the errors were through the, through the circuit. But it makes the whole thing much less local, and that that's a that's a difficulty. Are there questions? So Chen Wei or uh, Shen Gao, do you have any comments or you? This is Chen Wei. There's a question in the chat too. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Yeah, have, well, I have I answer that one first. So let's see. The the question: To what extent can this analysis be applied? when there is not polycoherent errors, say so you damping error. Yeah. So um, so the codes that we're dealing um, that we're working with correct arbitrary, say single qubit errors or or t qubit errors. And um, what that means is that if you have uh, um, uh, well okay so so the 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 formalism that I presented so far is for stochastic errors where you have a probability P 
of having some kind of error, which can be a non-poly error, um, and probably one minus p that it's perfect. Um, and so when that happens, you know, when you when you do the analysis of oh, does this gadget satisfy this Pauling property? You can do that with um, with uh, poly errors, and then by the linearity of quantum mechanics, all non-poly errors will work also. I mean, roughly the same thing happens when you go beyond the stochastic formalism. Um, uh, hold on. Um, when you go beyond the non-stochastic, when when you go beyond the stochastic formalism, where you can you can write your arbitrary error as uh, um, superpositions of poly errors or, or of other kinds of errors that have kind of bounded size. Um, and then basically the same thing happens. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a big complication because of the overlapping extended rectangles um, that actually you have to kind of be much more careful about how these things can add up because there can be some procurement additions and you have to, uh, you have to be careful with that. Um, but that's, that's in our original paper. Okay, so then other question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, how do you understand the locality in this approach, such as the, like the surface code? Right, so um, yeah, so that's again, something that's not very well captured by the current approach. Um, so so um, I, I think that's something, that's something that I would like to capture with this upgrade in formalism by saying, well, okay, so let's, we have, here, maybe let me share again and go back to that screen. Um, so suppose we have this, um, this, this filter here, the sets R of errors that we'll, that we'll be thinking about will be errors that are kind of geometrically local that are, that are clusters of errors that are all close to each other. Um, and um, then, you know, errors and faults of that, of that sort should combine to produce things that are also kind of geometrically local, that are localized in, you know, small number of spots. But, but uh, again, that turns out to be fairly complicated and I'm not quite sure how to make it all work. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions, Shin or Kai Feng? Anybody else? I did have one more thought, if I, if you don't mind, yet another one. Oh, okay. Um, I... My last one. Um, uh, it's really fun that you've generated what looks almost like a language that could be uh, accepted or rejected by a finite state machine. I think an FSM might be able to do it. Have you ever thought of that? Um, um, I mean, y yes and no. I mean, I, it's okay. So I, I, I guess I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind. So there's, there's two elements of it. So the one that's kind of more practically useful is the, uh, the, the, the various fault tolerance properties, the definition of fault tolerance. That's kind of a very cut and dried thing where you can just stick it into a computer and say, okay, I have some gadget let me check all the possible uh, sets of faults to see if it satisfies these properties or not. And that's something that, that we actually did in the original paper um, uh, in order to, to calculate you know, the threshold, was kind of calculating which, which sets of faults actually caused a correctness to fail and which ones didn't. Um, then the, the, the language that lets you manipulate these things and move things around I mean, yes, it is a kind of a formal language that lets you prove stuff like that. Um, I haven't really thought uh, what what you can do with that other than proving the specific things I wanted to prove, but uh, but oh, I get the possibility. I'm asking it kind of like a computer scientist might think to say, uh, does every fault tolerant quantum circuit have a succinct proof? So could you take the sequence of moves that you make and and then record them, and how short or long is that sequence have to be? Um, I mean, the moves that I allow in my language are of a very specific type, which is basically to do the proofs that I showed you, that you can convert these things into the ideal circuits, or the, if, you have, if 
you have bad rectangles, ideal circuits with some additional faults. Um, so there's not, it's not, it's not a very powerful language in that sense. Oh, I'm not concerned about the power, but rather the length. Um, I'm curious um, how many moves would be necessary, and if you could find that it's uh, 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 prove that it's polynomially findable for any circuit to find the set of moves to make it fault tolerant. Um, well, the, the point is that you the 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 language as I presented, you're given gadgets that are guaranteed are ready to be fault tolerant. And then once you do that, the, 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 the number of moves to convert it into the ideal circuit through these, through these, through these rules is just linear in the number of uh, locations, right? The number of gadgets. Right. I, I see I misstated. I, I should have clarified. Suppose you're given a circuit and then you wanted to identify which pieces comprise the gadgets that you made um, uh, or show that oh, it I does see. not. Um, yeah. Okay. That's something I've not thought about. I have no idea whether that would be easier or hard. Daniel, I'd like to thank you again for really giving a thought-provoking talk. I think everybody appreciated it. Maybe people can unmute themselves and give you a round of applause. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. See you next week. Yep. Okay. I like your 